Hey everyone. So, because I'm in my office and obviously we're not able to decorate right now in the lockdown, going and getting some stuff. And um, when I walked in, I saw my little friend. Don't be alarmed. He is made of uh, not bone, <laughs> but a resin material. Um, and I thought, I don't think I'm ever going to be smashing him to do a reconstruction video because I don't think it'll work. I think he'll turn something. So what should I name my friend, guys? Anyway, um, anywho, as they say, uh, so we're here and everybody I'm sure is on lockdown as we are. Greetings from South Wales. Hey, Lee. Hey, Susan. Um, doing a lot of um, trying to see what we can do from home. Um, kind of feeling like I'm restricted on some of the videos and stuff, but still connecting with people, doing a few more collaborations and really diving in and trying to um, get some good content to you guys. Getting a lot more, I think, views because <laughs> people are at home and getting bored and trying to watch stuff. So I'm getting a lot more questions from a lot of new viewers, which is really great. Oh, good morning. Spencer here in Michigan with me. So I had some questions. Um, a woman had said, I live near a crematorium and I never smell anything like burning smells. How is that possible? So the EPA regulates everything. And so there's a lot of filters. There's a lot that is put into making sure that there is no smells that come out of a crematory. Um, I'm people that are around it enough can detect a little something, but most people won't be able to tell that there's, there's any smells or anything. I know I was at a crematory once and they were changing, they had to change out something that had um, failed within the crematory and they alerted the EPA and they knew that for a couple of days they were going to be running without as much filter on it. So that what was coming out was a little darker than usual, but they didn't have any complaints from neighbors or anything like that. And when a person has severe tight lag or arm contractions due to illness, so they're bent, how do you place them on a removal cot or even into a coffin? Um, it, we talked about this, was it even last week? Um, you you can try to bend them out if you can. Some people are a little more aggressive, um, but I will see if it's rigor and if they will, you know, relax out and bend out or if they've been in that for so long, they're not going to move. So they're left that way and we work around that. Um, is aspirating ever so aggressive that it removes solid matter and tissue? Yes, bits of, bits of fascia, bits of internal organs and things come out through that trocar as well because you're breaking down the insides. And so little pieces of that come and go through. Sometimes it gets blocked up. The worst thing ever for an embalmer, I would have to say, is an aspirator backing up, which means the trocar gets blocked. And the pressure builds up and then eventually it comes back out the other side. And so sometimes you get sprayed. I thankfully have not really gotten sprayed. Um, I've gotten it quickly into a sink or, um, you know, away from me enough that I've not gotten sprayed, but it does happen. And it's not pleasant, um, quite gross actually. So that does happen sometimes though. Let's check questions. Um, have too many dead to keep up and they're sending the dead elsewhere. What countries are you talking about, Linda? I haven't heard anything about anybody sending dead elsewhere. Yeah, so right now there is a lot of countries that are limiting for funerals and limiting for, um, you know, at the cemetery and everything. Some are even saying no family allowed. So people are being buried without the family there. Um However, there are some that are trying to, you know, work with what the rules are. If you can only have 10 people in a room, they have separate rooms and they put 10 people in each room. Um, you know, just it's one of those things like we don't like it any more than the families we're serving because we understand and we're, we're there wanting to serve families, wanting families to have remembrances and gatherings for their loved ones. But not being able to kind of goes against what we believe a, 
about our industry. So um, trust me that this is not what we are wanting as well, but we have to stay safe and gathering a large amount of people together, especially elderly people is a horrible idea. And it's really counterproductive for what we're doing, trying to get the the virus to kill itself off by not having anywhere else to go. So we are trying and everybody else needs to do their part too, but businesses and people that keep functioning because they think that they can just get around the rules or people that keep doing work. I I get that we need incomes, but we need to stop functioning if we don't need to, you know, people die. We have to function as a funeral industry. Healthcare still needs to function, but you know, certain other things that people think are okay to keep doing, stop, like two weeks, just stop. It's just ridiculous. Um, are dentures removed before cremation? Um, no, you know, a lot of time dentures aren't in the person. If they're sent along with the deceased, then we dispose of them and we wouldn't cremate them with them. Um, but if they're in their mouth, we're not going to go in and instruct them out. Funeral home service. Um, what are your feelings towards free green burials? Um, free, like the company is, that's the whole purpose of the company, Chris, that they're just doing free green burials for everybody. I'm a flight attendant. I think I'm a good candidate for a funeral job because we deal with many people and situations. I think you'd be a clear, I think it would be so fun to be a flight attendant. Um, I think I would get annoyed though, because I could not buy company policy. You know, like those people that you tell them you can only have two carry-ons, but they bring three or four and you're not allowed to tell them no. All you can do is keep repeating the message to everybody and hope that they're going to pick up on the fact that it's them that's breaking on the rules. Yeah, I can't, I can't take those people. So maybe I wouldn't be a good flight attendant. I, I would be, I would say something and it would not be good. Probably I would get fired my first day. <laughs> um, whew. So I think funeral service is a necessary job. So I've got a guy named Steve asked me questions. He said he went out to the Rocky Mountain area um, a couple years ago. And he was walking down the school path with a beautiful overlook on a valley. And he looked down, there were some flowers and there was this pile of white kind of chalky remains. And he said it looked like what he would think cremated remains were. And so, yes, you may come across um, out in beautiful spots that were important to, you know, a lot of people maybe that someone is disposing of the cremated remains there rather because you can't, they don't blow off in the breeze. Um, so putting them there and, you know, that's where you're leaving them to be buried. I think it's odd just kind of dumping them on a pile on the side of the road. I would try and sprinkle them out a little bit so that they weren't as noticeable maybe. Um, but yeah, I can see it happening. So if you come across something like that, just let them be. I know Steve said he got curious and was touching them and wondered why they were a little bit chalkier. And we talked last week that sometimes, the cremated remains are pulverized longer depending on who's doing the processing. So you may get much more dust and a more chalky type thing. And some might be a lot grainier. So it just depends on who's doing that part of it. Union Pacific boy, I'm so sorry. Your uncle died. Yeah. There's a lot of deaths that are just happening because that's, the course of life right now, not from the Corona. And so a lot of people are being affected by the restrictions and what's happening within the funeral homes with caring for their loved one. And you know, that even for your uncle, you don't make the cut when it comes to immediate family. So his spouse and children and grandchildren are going to be the only ones getting to go to the service or to bury them most likely. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really, it's sad um, what's happening. Do you have any funny moments during embalming and dressing? I don't, I can't think of anything during embalming. I mean, there's things that happen in the moment that 
other people might find humorous, but I'm taking care of somebody that's died. Like to me, I can't, I'm not going to laugh at the deceased. Like that's bad to do. Um, during dressing, I have had, um, I was working with a man and he cut the, we cut the clothing down the back. A lot of people do. Some people don't, but a lot of people do. And he cut the dress to put on the woman. He cut it on the wrong side. So instead of in the back, he cut the front because he had no idea. (laughs) Um, So we had to quickly go find that dress um, at a shop again and buy a new one. Um, And we were able to find it, but um, that's always been funny. Or watching some men try and put on bras. I do find humor (laughs) And that there was a front closure bra once and he's like, I don't, I don't even know where to start with. <laughs> they had no idea what to do with it. So, uh, I'm from the Orkney islands off the Northern coast of Scotland. Our whole Island has one funeral director. That's so fun. Can I come to the or- Orkney islands? I need to look that up. Um, Tony. Yeah. More videos from Lyndon coming soon. I need to edit some more of what I, the content I have. I'm also going to shoot a video this week. I'm going to be doing a zoom video with Matt Uden, um, talking about kind of what's happening where he is with the lockdowns and how it's affecting business where he is because different country, different protocols, different everything. So we're going to talk a little bit this week. I think we're chatting on Friday. Um, so I'll be posting that as soon as I can. Shouldn't take much, shouldn't need much editing to it. So I'll get that hopefully posted over the weekend for an extra video for you guys. Hmm. Um, when driving the hearse, do you listen to music? Not typically. Um, not typically. And I usually be driving the the lead car. Um, and then one of the other staff members drives the hearse behind. So we lead with a lead car just to um, make sure the traffic stops and make sure to keep order. But I typically don't have music on because it would distract me and I would forget like where I was going or what I was doing. Uh, I was driving the lead car once with a pastor and we got t- chatting so much that it was like, are we going in the right direction still? Like I, I completely almost forgot where I was what I was doing and where I was. Um, Luckily I hadn't missed my turns or anything at that point, but we got really caught up in a conversation. And so I like to try and stay really focused because that's one of my biggest worries is I'm going to go the wrong direction or I'm going to miss my turn and I'm not going to get to the cemetery. So I always tell whoever's driving the hearse, if I go in the wrong direction, you go where you know you need to go. Don't follow me just in case. So um, when digging the holes for the cemetery, for the deceased in the cemetery, you dig in the spot marked, uh, the spot marked, uh, where the, and there's a casket. Um, so basically you run into an old casket. So there's a cemetery near me and the people who dig the graves there have said a couple of times now they've run into really old wooden caskets that are down there because the area used to be farmland, you know, years and years and years and years ago. Um, and so if they do that, they just fill the hole back in and mark it on their maps that that grave is taken and used. And so they make sure if it, that casket runs into another grave or not, if they have to mark off two is being used, but they you don't go down and disturb the casket. Um, in larger cemeteries, if there's somebody in the wrong hole uh, and it's a newer casket, then they've got a little bit of an issue because you have to figure out who that is and why they're there um, and where along the route, you know, there was a problem. So some vaults, depending on the style of vault, there's a nameplate on the top. So that's kind of helpful that if you get down and you find a casket that's in a vault, maybe there's a nameplate and it'll tell you a name or or something. Yeah, Linda, I'm kind of with you. I don't want to spend eternity wearing a bra. I I don't know that I do. (laughs) Becca, this is like, That is the question that makes me do what I do. Is it sad or unfortunate to you that most people don't know their rights in the funeral business? Very much. It's sad that they would be led astray by anybody or they would be given misinformation to try and direct their choices when there's a death, um, which is why I am really vocal, very honest um, with putting out content. You know, 
pretty much everything that people need to know. I have said in videos, it's just people seeing that information and passing it on. I've gotten a lot of emails this last week, which is so surprised. I always say it's surprising, but it's been kind of very pointed that people are telling me I just had a death and I use this information that I saw in one of your videos. I just buried my whoever and I made sure to tell my family this. Um, so that the information, not that it helped them, but that they pass something on to somebody. So that to me is really important. That's why I always say, if you see a video that resonates with you and that you learn something from, share it, send it to people in an email, share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, share it somewhere because somebody else needs to hear that information as well. Because what do I always say? You don't know what you don't know. And so enlighten somebody and let them know what they're rights are, what they should know when they walk into a funeral home. Um, yes, a lot of funeral homes are streaming things right now, Lee, um, as you can imagine, and um, trying. we're just trying to do what we can because people don't want to wait. Um, we want to help people have funerals in this, this time that we're living in. Um, and so thankfully, we can live stream things and, and put information out there. What are the requirements to bury your family on your own property or can that only be done in certain areas? It's all by your county and your township and you everywhere is different. I mean, shoot, there's areas you can't even bury your own pet on your land, let alone a person. But you would have to have part of your land. Like here, I've looked into it. Like if I want to go do this next week, um, I would have to have special permits from my county, my township, and then my deed or title to my home and land would always be marked with a huge thing that said human remains buried here. And there would be a map showing exactly where the human remains were buried. So every time you try and sell that property, that information always has to be there. If you plan to be there for a long time, that's great. Um, but at some point that property may get sold. Um, and so that has to go with it. So it may deplete the value of your property. Um, it may raise the value of your property if somebody else wants to come in and put in a little cemetery. So you just never know what it may do. Um, Dave, I'm not hiring because I'm just me. Um, I work as a freelance funeral director. So I go and I fill in at a lot of funeral homes that need help. Um, and so um, I'm not hiring. Um, my own care plan. So it changes, but I do have, um, you know, kind of what I want done, but a lot of them just leaving up to my family. It's what they want to do with me. Um, when the funeral home involved my aunt, she was very swollen after why is that she was sick with AFib and her face was shiny. So there's so many factors and questions that would need to be asked Thomas on that. You know, was she in the hospital? Was she on a respirator? Um, was she, you know, did she live for a while after she had a heart attack? Did, you know, there's a lot of questions that come into that. Um, the shiny face might have been just how her makeup was. Um, hey, everybody in Australia, I would love to come to Australia. The flight kind of really is scary to me. That's such a long flight to get to you but I would love to come to Australia. So that will happen at some point. Um, you were saying in an earlier video that a cloth cask is for poorer paupers. So it's not that it's just for poorer people, but that is the, that is the lower cost option that if a state is going to help pay for a funeral, that is what they say they will pay for. So a family can't go for a more expensive casket and pay the difference that is the casket that someone, if they're getting state aid here, has to use. No, no question. So it is more what you would say for a lower income family um, in that situation. And somebody said that you can hear me a lot more swallowing and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's that thing where you hate to hear people chew? Maybe it's you hate to hear people swallow too. Um, why do you have to cut the person's clothes when you dress them? You don't have to, Suzette. Um, there's a lot of funeral directors who do because the clothing lays better. Your body laying down is pressed out and 
shapen much differently than when you're upright standing in your clothing. So even pants are going to fit much differently when a person is laying down. So something that fits you standing up is not going to fit the same way laying down. A man's suit, pucker or shirt, like a shirt and tie, it puckers here, it pulls here. There's all these different things because of how the person fits in it when they're laying. So if the cut, that pressure is cut off the back, you can lay it and fit it around the person exactly how it needs to be. So you don't get the pulls, you don't get the puckers, you don't get all those things going on. There are some people who don't cut at all if they can help it. Um, And that's great for them. But I just know that I have seen in many situations how clothing fits better and looks better and appears better when it is cut. Um, Obviously, if somebody wants to keep something, I won't cut it. You know, we've had leather jackets that were like their motorcycle jackets um, with that they've wanted taken off after the services and given back. You know, these things I don't cut if I know, especially we have to give them back. Yeah, Chloe, it's hard when you're interested in something and it's a fear to other people. It makes you almost seem the oddball, but you're then the educated one. Guess what? When there's a death in the family and they don't know what to do, they're going to be calling Chloe. Um, Or when something happens and they need information, you're going to be the one educated in it. It's just an area that a lot of people, you know, don't want to know about and they want to be uneducated about. But if you let yourself be uneducated, then you also open yourself to being taken advantage of or not knowing the information when you need it. And so these are the people that then say, well, they didn't tell me, well, why didn't you know going in? That's what I ask. I'm not, it's not okay if somebody takes advantage of you. But what I'm saying is if you go to buy a car, you're going to look into you know, what you need to know about the cars. You're going to research, you're going to try and find the best one. Same should be about funerals. You're paying a crap ton of money for something. Educate yourself on making that purchase and on making those decisions. Don't leave it up to just chance. You would, you would educate yourself on doing that. You're not going to just go get married wherever you spend a lot of money on that event. You research it, you search it out, you go to bridal shows, you go dress shopping at 10 places, you go visit all these venues, you talk with different florists. You don't just pick a place and say, okay, let's do this. And then afterwards, regret, you do the research and you look into it. So same thing with funerals, do the research, look into it. If you don't know, learn, educate yourself on some of it. Oh, I'm close. Um, uh, Drew, you're asking what Potter's Field means. Go watch my two minutes on Potter's Field. <laughs> um, let's see. How do you deal with a family who is very emotional and higher adrenaline? Uh, I'm trying to think of a family I've met with that's really wound up. You know, sometimes you just have to meet the family where they're at. Um, and if they're really like wound up and, and like, just, I've, I've met with one family, um, recently and it was really, it was really exhausting because they just, everything in their mind was just coming out their mouths. And so trying to get the information I need, I had to do around all of their ramblings, Um, And so, because I couldn't get them to stop the rambling, which was fine, but I also have to accomplish what I'm, my job is to accomplish. And we figured it out over time um, between them on the phone and them just all over the place. Uh, And so, you know, some families you can say, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Let me get this part done. And then we'll, you know, move into that area. But this family wasn't working with it. We went from over here to over here to over here to over here to over here. That's not always going to work for every director. Luckily, my mind kind of works that way too, like a pachinko machine. Like I'm all over the place sometimes. 
maybe it's uh, part of my ADD. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I could bounce with them, which worked. Um, and I made sure at the end that I had everything, you know, all my boxes checked. Um, and so that's why stepping out of the room sometimes, getting yourself back focused and doing things or leaving something for them to focus on kind of brings them down. Highly emotional families, you you know, you just have to work with, with them through what they're going through. Always put it out there at the beginning saying, if at any point you need to just take a breath, you need to step out of the room, you need to get a drink, you need to do something, you know, go to the restroom. If you need to just take a moment, just let me know, throw up the red flag. We'll stop for a few minutes and step out. And I've had families that do that. But usually once we get into the swing and into the role of doing what we're doing, you know, I try really in those times to get people telling stories and I'm not just order taking or note taking. I do it with all the families I try to is, is get more stories out of them. Then if they tell me stories, I can pull from those stories, the information I need, um, and we can work on things. So, you know, it just depends. You don't, it depends how you start and how you approach it. So you could have the same family sit down with three different directors and you could have three different results. It just depends on who's working with them and their approach to it, Julie. Oh, hey, John. Thanks for joining again. Yeah, I think more people are going to catch live now that everybody's locked down at their home. Um, I nearly died three years ago from heart failure. I have always spoken with, about my funeral plans with family. They know I want to make my plans official with the funeral home. I think that's great to do. I think sometimes it does take that near-death experience to realize that we don't all have tomorrow. Anybody can go at any time. Um, and so having some information in place is really helpful. What do you like to know? All right. I don't know. You guys are chatting about something. That's great. I like when you guys chat. Um, let me go back over. I've got a couple more minutes. I had some questions. Someone had sent me something. I know I posted. So yesterday, guys, I'm only supposed to do one two minute video every week. Well, I had my schedule of them lined up. So yesterday you got two videos, one on, you know, what are funeral and a repasses and then one on necrophilia. So two very, very different topics. A lot of you really loved the necrophilia. Um, topic. And I, it, even though gross, it's quite interesting. Um, but somebody had said that, you know, I had said necrophilia is not a mental disorder. Um, and they had sent me something that the APA or American Psychiatric Association um, had said that, I'm going to read it, is a sexual attraction or sexual act which involves corpses. It is classified as a paraphilia by the World Health Organization. So it's not a mental disorder. It's a philia. It's a, you know, a compulsion, but it's not um, something like a bipolar disease. So it doesn't fall in the same category as that. But yes, it is defined by um, the APA. Let's see. Um, I get people are sharing some great things from funeral homes because everybody's putting out kind of press releases. So Ashley wrote me, um, my mother committed suicide about 15 years ago. This was the first time that anybody close to me had really died. I couldn't see what was going on. I felt like I was totally blind. Oh no, I don't know if it's because I'm totally blind and just couldn't see a lot of what was going on because I just don't know a lot about funerals, but I have a lot of questions. First off, she smelled terrible. I attributed this to her being dead in a car for three days. They did the best they could to make her look good, but I guess they couldn't make her smell good. Yeah, definitely. If she was had been dead for three days before they found her, and then they did an autopsy, and then they embalmed her, she would have smelled so drastically different, especially when you have a heightened sense of smell. Um, she would have been very different to you, for sure. Um, yeah, I would say there was probably a decomposition smell, then the autopsy smell and the fluid smell. She was also very puffy or bloated. Yes. She would have been probably a bit swollen from the decomposing. And then when you embalm someone who's decomposed, they will sometimes 
swell because the tissue is so loosened off of, you know, the layers of tissue of our bodies will start separating and breaking down between them. And so when you do embalm, the person will get a little puffier and bloated. Do you see this a lot in carbon monoxide deaths? Carbon monoxide death, um, not specifically, but because she had been in there for a few days, definitely. So carbon monoxide will also turn a person um, when you, you know, so you're in your car and you contain all the emissions from the car and you die from that, you'll turn a red color, sometimes cherry red, like bright, bright red. Um, she must have been leaking from somewhere because she won one of those plastic suits. I wouldn't say she was leaking, but because she had an autopsy most likely and because she had been dead for so long, they were probably trying to um, protect her. Um, her veins were bulging. If you could see like the for skin was discolored and there was some like dark lines and such, that's the decomp happening because the veins are starting to break down and bleed and bleach and that color sets into the skin. And that's a, a very true sign of decomposition. Cherry colored red. Is this common? Yes. One more detail. She had under, she had some fluid. She had a hole under her left ear with fluid coming out of it. So I'm guessing that was the bottom of the incision to where they cut open her cranium that you could probably see out of the bottom of where her ear was. So it wasn't just there. It went around her whole head, I'm guessing. Bolton, Michigan. Uh, my grandfather passed away two weeks ago and the experience was much different. They told me he looked like himself and you could barely smell the fluid. And I'm guessing that's because he, you know, died under care and was there with people. Um, I had another guy, John, wrote me, worked as a nurse in a nursing home for close to 20 years and now closing, posing, ooh, closing in on retirement, thinking about working part-time in the field. It is a great transition and is very common for part-time retired people to work part-time in funeral homes. And there's a lot of different things you could do. Hey, Bryson. Yeah. Coffee. Cheers. Um, the, at the funeral home, the part-timers can, you know, drive, do, do running where maybe you take a body from, let's say here in Michigan, you would take them to Virginia if they need to go to Virginia and it costs less than doing a flight or maybe running death certificates, picking up death certificates, um, working funerals, working visitations, helping move around flowers, flower delivery, things like that. So there's always stuff to be done by part-timers. They will train you there. Funeral homes, a lot of them are always looking for help. Um, you could do removals even. Um, so lots of things you could do with your local funeral home. Hey, Nancy. Um, do you know of a good resource of where I can find maybe a guide of what information the funeral home would need? Yes, Daniel Cox. So if you go to my website, there is a, it's just caringworthy.com. There is a page that um, it is, let's connect, consume, called consumer education. And you can get a, here, I'm going to link it right here. Look in the feed. If you go to that link right there. Um, and that's where you can order the arrangement packet that I have put together, all sorts of stuff that you would need. Um, the only thing would be you would need to get the price list from the funeral home that you were working with. Is it possible to get an autopsy report from the 1940s? Ooh, Emma, good question. Um, you'll need to call the medical examiner of the county that handled the death and ask them if they have reports from back then. So if it was something that was a police that, you know, involved the police, they may have it on record as well if it was a criminal thing. Otherwise, um, you'll have to just check with the medical examiner coroner. That would be where I would start. If it is rainy on the day of burial services, do you continue with burial or do you do a mock setup and then bury later? So um, I have never delayed um, and we have buried in some torrential rain before. Um, typically they'll pump the, they'll put up the tent for the vault and then they may pump then the grave out again at that point and then put the vault in. 
Um, sometimes the vault is out down there floating with some water on the outside, but at least the inside of the vault is dry for the burial part. You may get that if it's raining hard enough, the grave is caving in. And so we do an above ground setup where the vault is sitting up on the ground away from the grave. And we put the casket in the vault and the lid on the vault above ground um, in a you know covered area. And then they will just boom truck the whole thing down into the hole. Um, but that hole, you know, it's ground, there's water, there's going to be moisture. So unfortunately, sometimes there's going to be a little more water in it than there typically would be. Um, but I have never had to delay. I'm sure there's people who have depending on your water table. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, Bryson. So I am working, I'm, you know, as I'm working on trying to get a, a new name for my channel, whether it's just Carrie Northey, the mortician, um, or whatever it is, just to kind of define who I am rather than just Carrie Northey. So people know quickly that this is a mortician's channel or whatnot. Um, I'm waiting on some of it, but I have some coffee mug ideas that I think I'm going to go forward with and get, um, that'll be for sale. So I'll let you guys know as I have some of that. Um, it's weird for me to have merchandise. Like, hey, I have merch. That's so weird for me. Um, so there are things that new territory. I don't know what somebody would spend on a coffee mug if I was selling it. Like, I don't, I don't even know. Um, so some of that is just no idea. <laughs> no idea. Um Kate, baby, I don't know what you're asking. Um, I'm terrified of the deceased. Um, you're welcome, Daniel. I missed something there. So you'll have to email me if I need to know. Yeah, what would you guys spend on a coffee mug? We'll just ask that. No idea. What would you spend if you were buying a coffee mug, um, ordering it from somewhere? I think the shipping is what I need to figure out. I don't know what it costs to ship a coffee mug, five, $6. And then like, I don't know, 10 to $13 for a mug. I, I don't know. So maybe $20 total. I, I don't know if people would, would uh, pay $20 for a coffee mug. I have no idea. Um, so that's where I'm at. I got to figure some of that stuff out. I'm not a, I'm not a merchandising expert. I have no idea guys. Isn't it crazy? The things I, uh, so 10 to 15 plus shipping. Okay. I can do that. Well, I'll work on that this week. Um, I'm hoping some of those places are maybe working from home. Um, I do have another little, maybe I'll do another little live this week. I got some mugs from a company, um, Hilton Company, and they do like funeral stuff. And they did, they have a whole bunch of old, like comic-y, funerally type mugs from the funeral industry. Some of them are not funny and are actually bad taste. Um, but so it can show you where some people tried to be funny and it didn't work. Um, so we'll do maybe a mug, a mug reveal video. Uh, maybe tomorrow I'll do that live. So I'm trying to throw you guys some extra content though during these lockdown days because I know we all need it. Um, thank you so much, Jay. You're so sweet. Um, I've never done where the full visitation is at home, Lori. Um, I, I've taken caskets to the home, not a lot, but um, a little bit. So well, I'm going to check off. I try not to keep these too long, but thank you guys for joining me as always. Um, hopefully next week I need to work on, this is killing me how boring this is. I need, I need something. I know it doesn't deter from you guys, but since I'm seeing it the whole time, <laughs> the whole time, I need to do something. I just don't know what. So I need to just have a decorator come over here and make me a video space. So, well, thank you guys so much. Have a good week. Um, thanks for sticking with me and I will see you guys soon. And there'll be a video on Friday posting. My girls are in it. We're going to do a live premiere of it because they want to watch people watching the video, which is of them. It's a short, fun one we did as a collaboration with somebody else. So make sure you check that out on Friday and my girls will be watching it with me. So if you watch it with us, make sure to say hi to them. They will love it. See you guys later.